I think he handled that well. Yes. <laughs> On behalf of the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire, we would like to welcome you in this time of celebration preceding the unveiling of the historical rock rest markers. There are two of them. One is in Wallingford Square, and the other, which is downtown Kittery for those of you who may be visiting, and the other is located at Brave Boat Harbor Road in Kittery Point. You know the proverb from a communal group. Some say it's an African proverb, some say it's Native American, but it's a communal proverb. It takes a village to raise a child. Well, the Sinclairs were part of the village I was raised in. They helped to shape me. They were one of the voices in my life that said, there are no limits to what a little girl like you can do. So you're here today to celebrate some people who made a difference in the world. They lived in difficult times. We're living in difficult times. But somehow, in some way, they were able to be creative and make a way where there was no way. Can I get a witness? At a time when African American citizens were relegated to being wayfaring strangers, they poured into lives, making hospitable places on a landscape that was arid and inhospitable to people who look a certain way. The Sinclairs created streams in deserts, amen? amen. I can't help myself. Ways out of no ways, amen? amen? When we remember them, when you and I remember them today, we are pushed to ask ourselves, are we doing the same? Today we celebrate the creative force that push this couple to help create a way out of no way. We celebrate their willingness to do that, which was not what? Which was not easy in a difficult time. It is good to have each of you here today. The food was good. We thank those who provided it. We thank uh, the team that created this, uh, this day, this event, headed by Captain Noor. <laughs> executive director of the New Hampshire Black Heritage Trail, who's standing in the back there. Yeah. And let's just face it, somehow the hands of the clock have slipped backwards on us. There's no technology that I'm aware of that can change it, so we look to each other to do what the Sinclair's modeled. I'd like to thank Pastor Brad Hurst and the congregation of this here church today. <laughs> for hosting this event. So generous you are and so human to get up before all of you and confess <laughs> his sins. <laughs> so generous by letting us be here. Thank you so much, Pastor Brad, who is now going to share some remarks and a prayer. Yes, public confession is good for the soul. <laughs> every religious tradition, every spiritual path, has something along the lines of the golden rule. We all know this, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Variations on that theme run through all religious traditions. It is nearly universal. It provides a moral compass for our life together. It provides guides for how we treat one another and the world around us. In the Christian tradition, when we stray from that path, 
we are urged to repent, literally to turn around, to correct our behavior. But not only to correct our behavior, to cease doing what has caused harm to someone else, what has caused brokenness in our relationship with others, but also work to heal that hurt. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen the photographs from 1924 or 1925 of the robed and hooded Ku Klux Klan walking through uh, Wallingford Square, right past the place where we will be unveiling a marker in a few minutes. The archives of this church show that in that same period of time, standing room only meetings were held in this space on certain Sunday evenings. They were also held in the Grange Hall, a block and a half away. And while not specifically naming them as such, they were in fact gatherings of the Ku Klux Klan in these very pews. Sometimes we stray from the path, and sometimes the path is just flat out wrong. And we are called to turn and do something new. And we welcome you all here today. Today we repent from what is past and work to heal that injury. Will you pray with me, please? Spirit of peace and healing, justice and love, we bring all of who we are to this place at this hour. We bring the hurtful mistakes of the past. We bring the good intentions of the present. And we bring our bright hope for the future. Move among us, O God. Bind us one to another. Bless our gathering and our words and our actions on this day, that in this hour we might fashion a stronger and more just community for tomorrow. We pray these and all things in all your holy names. Amen. Amen. fortunate this afternoon to be able to hear from the acclaimed historian, exhibit curator, distinguished professor and director of the Cooperstown Graduate Program at the State University of New York, Dr. Gretchen Soren. She spent 25 years researching the book that inspired the PBS documentary Driving Wild Black. Space and Mobility in America, which Soren directed with filmmaker Rick Burns. My turn? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to be with you this afternoon. It's, it's really an honor. Um, it, was, it was more than 20 years ago that my friend and colleague uh, Richard Candy from Boston University called me, and I remember it was on a Wednesday afternoon, um, and he told me about Rock Rest. And I will tell you, I drove with my husband and son to Maine that Friday. Um, it was, I was in the process then of doing research for my book, Driving Home Black, and I knew that the existence of African American tourist accommodations um, was rare and the existence of places that were intact, like Rock Rest, was absolutely unheard of. And so I was very excited to learn that 
here was this place that looked as if Hazel and Clayton Sinclair had just stepped out the door and locked it, and, and it was a time capsule. And so um, I came up with my family that weekend and spent the weekend transcribing Hazel's travel diary and photographing the inside of the building. And it was incredibly exciting. Um, it was like this time capsule that told the story not only of de facto segregation, but really um, of African American life in America. Um, I think that Rock Rest is not just a locally important site, but a nationally important site because it tells us so much about black history, black resilience, entrepreneurship, and um, black resistance at a time when travel for African Americans was fraught with tremendous danger on the road. It was also more than 20 years ago that I called a colleague of mine at the Smithsonian who agreed that the importance of this place um, was, was incredible. And today, Rock Rest figures very prominently in the exhibitions at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I'd like you to imagine, if you would, what it must have been like for African Americans to go out in their cars to visit relatives or to take their children to college or to go on vacation like other Americans. They could not stop in a roadside restaurant or use the bathrooms at the gas station or find a hotel for the night. They had to constantly worry about where they would um, be welcome and where they would not be welcome. Sometimes they had to sleep in the car. Sometimes they had to carry gasoline in the car because gas stations would not serve them. Places like Rock Rest offered respite from the racism of the world. They were places of rest and renewal. Um, they were places where you could enjoy good food and the company of others without the stress of the racism that African Americans faced in their daily lives. Now, although many of the tourist spots um, were listed in African-American guidebooks like the Negro Motor Screen Book or Travel Guide, and there were dozens of others. Rock Rest depended only on word of mouth to let people know. Um, and people came year after year. The same families came. They enjoyed Rock Rest. They enjoyed the company of their friends. Um, we know that only about 5% of the tourist accommodations that were in the, those African American guidebooks still exist. Most of them were destroyed by urban renewal or by the construction of highways, which was ironic because African Americans loved to stay on the highway because it was safer than going through small towns. And yet, um, highways, when they were built, were often built through black neighborhoods, destroying those neighborhoods. So there are not many of these extant monuments to the ancestors. So remember that we honor, we honor the great leaders of the civil rights movement like Martin Luther King and Fannie Lou Hamer and John Lewis, but ordinary African Americans like Clayton and Hazel Sinclair also fought discrimination every single day, not only through their involvement with civil rights organizations, but also by fighting against Jim Crow segregation and providing those safe havens for black travelers. Um, so they were heroes too. So let me congratulate you all on your, um, on your signs and on shedding a light on this history. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here with you. Sorry. Any 
amen is, is it's good to say amen, Reverend Thompson. Amen. <laughs> amen. Some would say that the students who are coming up next are our future leaders. I would say no, they are leading now. <laughs> I love that. They are leading right now. <laughs> to show what we're made of, and they're showing it every day. They're make a, making a difference now, and we welcome and applaud them. So I'm going to invite Ni Nguyen, NAACP Youth Council Vice President, to have a few words at this moment. Ceremony. So, as you know, Rock Rest is a summer retreat for African Americans in Maine that was not available for most people of color during the age of segregation. So, prior to the federal rights uh, legislation in 1964, racial discrimination was practiced in New England without notice and no legal recourse for a black visitor approaching a restricted white space. Those kinds of degrading experiences could be avoided with access to a pocket guidebook identifying establishments which offer safe accommodations and recreations in selected locations. However, Rock Rest, like most minority, um, small minority businesses across the country during that era, was only promoted only by word of mouth. But in the beginning of the year, the beloved site was at risk of not being protected. However, the NWAC Youth Council partnered with um, the Black Heritage Trail to fund to fund two walk two two markers to preserve the history. Um, with the NRC Youth Council fundraising one half and the Black Heritage Trail fundraising the other. So this allows us to trust the raw labor thus inquires in main Black American space in establishing social upper mobility in the Sea Coast area. We would especially like to thank you all in our program for your generous contributions and for elevating the NWACP Youth Council's mission to uplift the voices of people of color. So in addition to fundraising at Rock Rest, we also organize rallies and lobby with legislators against the passage of HB2, which restricts conversations about race in classrooms. So while our state legislators fail to listen to our voices and pass policies that elevate, um, that are underrepresented communities, and there was CP Youth Council, we still like to make plans to further enable youth power to change the conditions in our community. Specifically, the Youth Council has gone to work with the Reese Bacon Project Gym on the 400 anniversary child mirror for Fort Smith and Dover, which are focused on Indigenous and Black history. The mirror aims to raise our nation and acknowledge the contributions and strides made by Black and Indigenous people. So, as an Asian American, I personally faced discrimination from my peers and I found healing in working solidarity with our people of color in the Youth Council. And as president of the Seacoast Youth Council, I can confidently say that my experience has been rewarding as I got to my journey in social justice, not limited within my school community, but with our leaders in the Seacoast area. We're always looking for new members, so I urge you all to find youth so they can learn from each other and improve our communities. Again, thank you so much for listening, and please let our council advisor in your street if you know anyone that's interested. Have an amazing rest of your day. <laughs> heartfelt remarks and I think she put the word out there the youth council is looking for members so please let let any youth in your life that have a passion the same passion that he has let them know about the youth council let's give her another round Langston Hughes a dynamic poet 
Um, one Way Ticket is a poem that will be read next by E.A. Vargas and Jacqueline Jalla. They are both sixth graders, soon to be seventh graders at the Shapley Middle School. Come on up, ladies. <laughs> Chicago, Detroit, Buffalo, and St. Scranton. Any place that is north and east in New York City. I pick up my life and take it on the train to Los Angeles, Bakersfield, Seattle, Oakland, Salt Lake, any place that is north and west and not south. I'm fed up with Jim Crow laws, people who are cruel and afraid, who lynch and run, who are scared of me and me of them. I pick up my life and take it away on a one-way ticket, gone up north, gone up west, gone. Thank you for listening and letting us share this poem with you all. I hope you participate in the other events today. This is a quick change in the program in addition. I'm going to uh, ask up now Sharon Jones. She's going to give you some words. She knew Mrs. Sinclair, Mr. Sinclair, you're really going to enjoy what Sharon Jones has to say. Come on up, Sharon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I was asked to come and tell my personal side of the story of Mr. and Mrs. Sinclair's fabulous and eloquent inn. You heard the historic side of it. Now you have to imagine I was about 14 or 15 years old. It was summertime and school was out. And I was happy where I was, home, with my siblings and the big house that we lived in up on Cut Street in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. But let me reel back for a second here just to tell you how I got here. My parents came to uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire from upstate New York, <coughs> Seneca Falls, New York. And my father was called to Portsmouth uh, with three different um, opportunities. And he chose the naval shipyard. He was a, uh, a civil engineer. But Portsmouth was not what my family had expected it to be. My mother and father came here with 11 children. And my younger sister Karen and I were born in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So that morning, while I was lying on my bed on a summer, warm summer morning, breeze blowing through the window and a curtain swaying in, you know, that perfect lady looking type of a picture. <laughs> When my mother called, Sharon, you never said what to your parents back then. <laughs> if you did, yeah. they came up and got you. <laughs> so I said, yes. Could you come downstairs for a moment, please? I went down the flights of stairs. I said, I'd like to talk to you about possibly working for the sun. I said, working? He <laughs> said, I don't work. This is vacation. I'm off by the school. 
She said, well, sit down here. Let me explain. A couple from uh, Kittery, Maine, has a, an inn where they are looking for two young people to uh, be as like a, ho a hostess. And I would like you to have the experience by going. And I said, well, how long do I have to stay there? And she said, oh, summer. <laughs> do I come home at night? It, no, you stay there all summer. You're going to be working there for Mr. and Mrs. Sinclair. So uh, obviously I had to accept my mother, accept it on, on my behalf. And the other young person who was asked to come was Valerie Cunningham. So Valerie Cunningham and I spent the summer with Mr. and Mrs. Sinclair at the inn. Rock Rest. I'm going to call it Rest Rock sometime. <laughs> the experience that I had there was one that I had not expected. The first two weeks were frightening. And so were Mr. and Mrs. Sinclair. <laughs> <laughs> they were very stately and um, intimidating in a way for a young person. She gave Valerie and I the rules and regulations and what we would be doing for the summer there. We'd be making sure that when the doctors and lawyers and school teachers and engineers came there for their meals, most of the time they weren't, they weren't anywhere to be found during the daytime. They'd be out doing what, you know, doing what we do when we're visiting another place. But we had to rise early in the morning and I remember lying there in bed and listening to the, um, the rooster. And Mr. Sinclair said, when you hear that sound, get up. <laughs> well, it wasn't light out yet. <laughs> and Valerie would say, Sharon, get up. The rooster can hear it. I said, what kind is it? Quarter past five. They're going, to be, they're going to be coming down for breakfast shortly. Get up and get cleaned up. We've got to get our uniform on and go. So we did, and we'd go to the kitchen and we'd, st we'd stand there. Um, we were taught to just stand at the end of the table and wait for the guests to come down. And Mrs. Sinclair would nod when it was time for us to move toward the table and serve from the right side. And Make sure the breads and the coffee was all passed in order the way it was supposed to be. So we learned all of that very well. The weekend came and I thought I was supposed to go home on the weekend. <laughs> so I was waiting for my parents to come and get me. And Mrs. Sinclair said, where do you think you go? I said, what, five days straight? She said, no, 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 we got Saturday and Sunday. Those are big days. <laughs> Went back in, put my uniform back on. <laughs> what I found amazing was that these wonderful guests were doctors and lawyers and teachers and had professions that you, you didn't see in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So as a young girl, I wasn't aware that blacks had these positions as in abundance as they were coming. They would file in in the morning and very poised. They, the husbands always pulled the chair out for the wives and the silverware was in the right place and everyone spoke quietly. And that impressed me because I'm one that feels that there is 
there's a behavior for every situation. Mm. And when you're at a restaurant or a table eating, it doesn't call for voices to be raised and shouting and hollering. And, and I love that about them. I was honored, impressed, and I had the pleasure of having conversations with these wonderful people. It got to the point where I was actually enjoying being there. And when they left, I felt a void because we were there all summer and used to the rooster waking us up and the coffee that was perking and the, the muffins and the cornbread and the apple pie that was smelled. Mrs. Sinclair was amazing with her, her cooking and her pastries and the, the collard greens and the fried chicken and the apple pan deli. I mean, it was wonderful. Mr. Sinclair would make sure all the other things around the house were done. You know, the things that guys did back then and women do now. <laughs> <laughs> end of the summer came and, and, and I, 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 I felt the sadness. And what I took away from being there that whole summer was knowing that we all are part of the same playing ground. We just have to recognize it and let each other in. It was a marvelous an educational experience for me. And as I watched them all, Mr. Sinclair drove everyone back to their places where they had their cars or whatever. They were just so eloquent and elegant, the whole situation was. And I walked away from there feeling like, you know, It really is possible for change. And it will come because Mr. and Mrs. Sinclair were two of the people that paved the way. They showed that it could happen and things got better from there. And it's something I will never forget as a teenager. Never had that experience. It experience it, 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 it um, opened my mind. You know how you'll have an, an, an experience, things are mundane, and all of a sudden something will happen and you say, yeah, that, that's right. And your, your heart opens up and your head opens up because you know you can walk into a door that you hadn't been in before. Yeah. And I'm so grateful. And thank you for having me.
find this moment astonishing. Awakening keeps, awakening is continuing. To see what's accomplished, to see so many people concerned and, and caring in terms of a people who were once totally invisible, if you will, in records and such at the beginning of Old Kittery Parish. Um, I've had the good fortune as a white woman to have my attention directed to the vital part of American history, African American history. Valerie Cunningham was sharing her research on Portsmouth in the 1990s, getting ready for her first draft of the uh, what would become the course of the Black Heritage Trail. I, on the other hand, was a <clears throat> guide at the Warner House Museum in Portsmouth, um, attempting to write a story about the white children who lived in that house. And after talking with Valerie and learning about her research, I began to see that house and its occupants entirely differently because Warner House had enslaved people there. But it wasn't until one day when I was walking through the house trying to get an idea of what I was going to do, how I would change my white children's story. <clears throat> I climbed the stairs up into the little cupola at the top of the building. And instead of seeing white children playing up in that fun little room up there, I saw a lovely little black child in my mind. I went home, said goodbye to the white children, and began the story about a family typical experience. The story, the characters are fiction, but the experience of those, of the family, the black family that was held enslaved in that house are based on what Valerie was teaching me. Um, I did eventually write a sequel to the first book because I sent the family into Boston at the end of the story. However, I had much more privilege uh, when the Kittery Point uh, Congregational Church was going to celebrate uh, the 300th anniversary of the building. I thought I might take, <clears throat> excuse me, I thought I might take what I had learned and do more research and perhaps uh, come up with some black people who had been uh, in that church during the era of enslavement. And of course, as you probably know if you've done research, you don't just do a little bit. There's always this rabbit hole over here and that rabbit hole over there. It's enticing and you follow, and thank goodness I did. So as a result, I was able to uh, make a large population of people who were once invisible, visible. And uh, I'm just grateful that uh, life gave me that opportunity. Uh, but what's thrilling to me is to realize that where my job was to make visible, to uncover uh, what you're doing now and what hopefully you will continue doing is more uncovering, more awareness, helping the public understand that America is of one piece, regardless of the color of one's skin. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I think what the Sinclairs accomplished, in spite of the injustice around them, is just so amazing that continuing another step in that road of struggle to uh, bring the Black Americans into the place where they've always been and where they certainly always belong. So, thank you.
sentence or just the way fate works. But my book, Lives of Consequence, is having difficulty getting out to the public. <laughs> uh, it was published by the Portsmouth Historical Society, but there was a snafu with Amazon at one point. They wanted a lot of money for things. And so my book is not out of print, as Amazon indicates, but it is available from many other places. Thank you. She wanted me to hold you. Thank you, Kat. Well, we thank you. I love that awakening is continuing. Something hopeful there, um, more uncovering. So we're challenged to be a part of that uncovering and that awakening. Thank you so much. Uh, we're honored right now to have another student leader, another voice, who's in the day-to-day -day struggle. Um, Reka Mach Devon. From, uh, from the Seacoast NAACP Youth Council. She's also a tour guide on the Black History Trail in New Hampshire. Come on up. and a tour guide at the Black Heritage Trail and a member of NAACP Youth Council. I first became involved with the Black Heritage Trail at the beginning of my junior year when I began working on a project to build recognition for the neglected gravesite of an African-American family from the 19th century in my hometown of Madbury. Uh, finding out about this gravesite really saddened me and moved me to take action. I met with local historians and professors to learn as much as I could. Eventually, I was able to find out that the gravesite consists of five unmarked stones that belonged to George and Mary Hall and their three children. After being unable to create physical recognition for the site, as it's currently on private property, I reached out to the Black Heritage Trail to see what else I could do. Eventually, I was able to build as much recognition as I could through, vi through videos and presentations. However, I'm still working to see what more I can do. In school, we've always really been taught about the history of the country and the world as a whole. We've never really dove into the local history and background of our own hometowns. However, working on my aforementioned project and becoming involved with the Black Heritage Trail and the, N and the NAACP has taught me so much about the importance of recognizing local history of people of color. I have learned that working to combat an issue, a local issue of social justice is just as important as contributing to national and global issues. I have always believed that education is the root of change, and I feel so lucky to have had the opportunity to spread knowledge on diversity and history in my community. I am so excited to be here today at the unveiling of the Rockrest Markers. I believe that markers like these truly make a difference and I'm so happy to be a part of this. Thank you so much to everyone who has made this possible. Being here gives me so much inspiration and hope for the future. She mentioned that being here had give, has given her hope for the future. We hope that you feel that way. We hope that this has been more than a program. It's something that will infuse you with strength for difficult times. And we want to invite up a uh, member of uh, the chair of the Kittery Town Council, my town council. I'm a Kittery girl, so we want to invite Judy Spiller up to So much thank you for including me this has really been a, a, a lovely event and it does after uh, a month or so well longer than that pretty grim times it's nice to feel good about things yeah. uh, on behalf of the Kittery Town Council I want to express our thanks to the uh, Black Heritage Trail for the long overdue recognition of Rock Rest 
and the Sinclair family. Kittery is in the process of celebrating its uh, 375th year. Uh, that history is missing a huge chunk. Recognition of Rockbreast and Sinclair's contributions is a way of bringing wholeness to our history. It is also a very important window into post-World War II Jim Crow in this country and in Kiri. I do want to mention that uh, Kiri Town Council has just formed a Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Our goal is to try to make sure Kittery is the community that we want it to be, a community that honors its residents, no matter their race, gender, orientation, religion, socioeconomic status. I'd like also like to mention that uh, Councilor Stevens, who's Wag your hand, Councillor Stevens, uh, is one of the members of that committee, as I as am I. We've got six, six residents and some other representatives that are part of that committee. Finally, because I think we want to get outside because the sun is out, and uh, that, that can be brief based on this week's weather. Uh, on a very personal note, I would like to thank Valerie Cunningham, who has done so much um, in the Seacoast. Uh, done it with such tremendous grace, but I'm going to thank her for many years ago introducing me to Rock Rest and the Sinclair family. Thank you very much. We're, we're headed towards the home stretch now, the exit's coming up, so. Um, but I want to just thank you for coming. I want to let you know we'll be walking down to Wallingford Square, those who are able to do so, for the first unveiling, which will be done by the executive director of the Black Heritage Trail, Jerry Ann Bogus, and for those who can do that. Then afterwards, there'll be a bus we can board together and head down to Brave Boat Harbor Road in Kittery Point, uh, where Kelvin Edwards and Reverend Robert, Robert Thompson will have some closing words, and as well as the executive director unveiling that as well. We know some of you will be able to do that in some world, but we loved being together. And I just hope this is a springboard for you to know we can get through this. Uh, awakening is continuing. Um, more uncovering, as the author Wall said this afternoon. I want to share a couple of songs with my brother, music T.J. Wheeler. I've known him for many decades. And when the song is over, feel free. We'll we'll just head on down the road. He's, we'll ease our way down the road. Uh, this is a, the first one. Is uh, it's really one song with two songs in it. Uh, Wayfaring stranger which is, uh, I think, what my family and I felt like headed down to Mississippi. We had to cook all the food, uh, couldn't sleep anywhere but on the side of the road. And when you got there, you were tired and dirty and smelly. You know, I remember that. I, I was born in uh, the late 50s, but I'm old enough to remember going through that. And the second one is more upbeat. Uh, I got shoes. I can go where I want, when I want, because I have. I have me some shoes, okay? So let's go, TJ. And 
that bright world to hold child. I'm going there. Choose my love. 